Since ancient times, the Himalayas have loomed large in the consciousness of the Indian people, geographically, politically, and most of all, in the context of religious belief and practice. This was perhaps in part because the ritual drink of Soma was fetched down from Mount Munjuwand in the Himalayas during the Vedic period. As Professor A.B. Keith explains, the mountain birth of Soma is made more precise by the epithet Maujavada, which seems to point to Mount Munjuwand, and the Avesta declares that Hauma grows in the mountains. The bringing of Soma from the mountains was no doubt a physical act, performed regularly by the priests or on their behalf. At the same time, the majestic beauty and vast scale of the Himalayas also impressed itself on the Indian mind from an early date. Yasye me himavanto mahitwa Yasye samudram rasaya saha ho ho Yasye maha pradesho Yasye bahu Kasmai de vaya hivisha vidhema Whose power is represented in these snowy mountains? Whose are the oceans together with the rivers? Whose these regions of space? Whose arms? To what such god should we offer oblations? In subsequent literature, the Himalayas have been the subject of praise and veneration in their own right. Many poets provide elaborate descriptions of the Himalayas in terms of their status as source of the holy Ganges River, as the abode of Shiva and his family, and, in fact, as a site of a multitude of activities, especially those connected with romance or spirituality or both. The opening verse of Kalidasa's long poem, Kumara Sampaba, setting the scene for the romance of Parvati with the ordinarily ascetic Shiva, provokes a sense of awe at the immense scale of the Himalayas in the following terms. There is, in the northern direction, a divine-souled king of mountains named Himalaya, plunging into the eastern and western oceans, stood like the measuring rod of the earth. In his shorter poem, Meghaduta, Kalidasa also extols the beauty of the Himalayas in terms that show its romantic and spiritual significances. Having reached the Himalaya mountain, which is the source of that river Ganga, white with snow, its rocks fragrant with the musk of the deers that sit on them, while you rest on the peak of that mountain to recover from the journey, you, the rain cloud, will take on an appearance like mud kicked up by Shiva's white bull. Kalidasa's naturalistic descriptions of the Himalayas in the Mekaduta lead some to believe that he had first-hand experience of spending time in the mountains. This is perhaps not the case for Bharavi, who is sometimes surmised to be a South Indian, who would have drawn perhaps on his reading and his imagination to depict the Himalayas in his long poem Kirat Arjuniya. Here, Parvi creates a similarly elaborate description of the Himalayas in the fifth canto as a setting for the romantic activities of Apsaras and Gandharvas and for the ascetic practices undertaken by Arjuna in the first part of this poem. As Professor Indra Vishwanathan Peterson explains, the syntactically connected description of the Himalaya in the first 15 verses, echoes Kalidasa's celebrated opening description of the mountain in his court epic poem Kumara Sampava, The Birth of Kumara. Thus, the opening verse of this description too stresses the immense scale of the mountains from a human perspective in a way which also elevates the human explorer who wishes to tackle these mountains. Next, 
Arjuna launched out onto the mount, mighty snowy mountain, wanting perhaps to conquer the mountain Meru, or perhaps to see the most distant horizon, or perhaps to soar above the clouds. Like Kalidasa frequently does, Bharavi also mentions Shiva in connection with the Himalayas, and similar to the above verse, in an analogy that plays on the similarity of form and colour on a massive scale. From one side, lit by the moving sun, from the other, constantly covered in the darkness of night, as if Shiva is breaking through the heaped darkness in front of him with his laughter, while his elephant hide lies behind him. The connection of the Himalayas with the divine and supernatural is, of course, a prominent theme in much Indian poetry, and the next line of Bharavi's poem reads as follows. For the inhabitants of the earth, the skies, and the world of gods, unseen by each other, yet becoming a single home, like a replica of the cosmos created by Shampu to reveal his supremacy. Indeed, a special aesthetic quality has been perceived in mountain landscapes by many peoples of the world. In Chinese culture, mountains are also connected with deities and with the sacred, especially through Taoism, and as such, have been a prominent subject in Chinese painting. In European thought, mountain landscapes such as the Alps have been connected with aesthetic qualities such as the sublime since at least the 18th century. In this regard, Edmund Burke explains, Astonishment, as I have said, is the effect of the sublime in its highest degree. The inferior effects are admiration, reverence and respect. Greatness of dimension is a powerful cause of the sublime. We may indeed perceive some of the same features at work in the earlier description of the Himalayas by Bharavi. Thus, as Professor Indira Vishwanathan Peterson also explains, the tone of this chapter is set in the long description of the Himalaya mountains with which it opens, suggesting the aesthetic emotion of wonder. To facilitate and underscore the wonder of the mountain, here Bhairavi employs a variety of meters, colorful and fantastic imagery, and figures of speech based on play of sounds, words and patterns. Indeed, our concern with the vastness of space and its emotional effect on us is already found in the Rig Veda, in sections such as Book 1 verse 185, which expresses wonder at the overwhelmingly vast dimensions bounded between the earth and the skies above as Professor Wendy Doniger explains about this section. The expression, sky and earth, guard us from the monstrous abyss, is repeated at the end of many of the verses. The word abvam designates a dark, formless, enormous and terrifying abyss, particularly associated with night and the underworld and hence opposed to the light of the worlds of sky and earth. We may end with another verse from the Mekaduta, in which Kalidasa weaves a strong moral message into a poetic depiction, as indeed he frequently does throughout his poetry. If a forest fire sparked when pine tree branches rub against each other and spread by the wind, burning the hairy tails of the yaks with fireballs, should trouble the mountain. You should completely extinguish it 
with thousands of rain showers. To explain, the wealth of the uppermost in society is for the purpose of relieving the suffering of the afflicted.